Takže dobrý večer. Uh, Měj jméno je Jana Vinčová, jsem z Czech Designu a vítám vás, na, uh, vítám vás na dalším z přednáškových večerů našeho cyklu Budoucnost designu, které, uh, za který děkujeme norským fondům, kteří tento projekt podpořili. Dnes již po třetí zde máme hosta z Velké Británie, je to logické, Velká Británie od průmyslové revoluce udává tempo oboru design. Naš, naše pozvání tentokrát přijal profesor Guy Julier, který je vedoucím výzkumných a vzdělávacích aktivit jedné z nejvýznamnějších muzejních institucí vůbec, Victoria Albert Museum. Uh, thank you, Guy, very much that in your very busy program you found the time to organize a lecture here. And now over to you. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's very nice to be in front of such a good looking audience. <laughs> so I'm going to take pictures. Um, many thanks to Czech Design for inviting me here. It's great to be back in Prague. This is only my second visit here, um, and it's a very different place than the first time I was here, because the first time I was here, I arrived by bicycle in 1983. Um, and uh, yes, a lot's happened uh, uh, since then. I mean, just to give you a sense of um, kind of where my background is then, um, I had, at the time, I just uh, graduated in history of art from the University of Manchester. And the reason I came to Prague was that, uh, well, three reasons. Uh, one was that my professor, one of my professors had told me about the very close link between the medieval architecture of Peter Parler, you know, your cathedral, San Vites, um, Cathedral and Kudnahura and all that, with uh, medieval architecture in the southwest of England, which I was very interested in. So I wanted to come and see the, uh, the links there. Uh, the second reason is I really just wanted to find out about life as was behind the Iron Curtain in the Soviet bloc, and that was very interesting. And I think the third reason, which I didn't admit to at the time, was that I think I was trying to hopefully hoping to find a nice exotic Central European girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't manage that, and I, I blamed that on the uh, language barrier, uh, but it's probably something else. Um, I, I hope you can understand me. If there's anything I say you don't quite understand or catch, just put your hand up and, uh, and ask. Uh, I'm really hoping that you will ask questions, and maybe at some point I'll stop my lecture to ask if you've got any questions to that point. And I've brought along an incentive, okay, so I brought three books, um, and the first three questions will each get a book. Uh, the first uh, question gets my very own book, The Culture of Design, um, the third edition. Uh, and then just to promote the family business, I've, I've, um, I brought um, two novels by my girlfriend, Diane Setterfield. These are, the, these are actually translations into Czech, so um, that's uh, rather nice. Uh, we, we need the space at home as well. So, um, so, so there's your incentive. Do ask questions. Um, so um, the title then is about design and financial uh, crisis and reasons to celebrate, and I'll get onto that later. Uh, this is something of the um, structure of my lecture. I'm going to start by talking about this thing of, about futures and trends and patterns, because after all, the uh, overall theme of these lectures is about future of design. Um, and then I'm going to take very, three very big themes, globalisation, urbanisation, activism, and then return to this idea of futures. Now, I'm not necessarily going to be talking about design objects. I'm personally more interested at the moment in designing and how designers then organise themselves, how they work, how they respond to changing uh, conditions. And I'm going to do something of a kind of global tour of uh, one or two places which I think are interesting uh, at the moment. But anyway, this thing about future of design, um, and it seems to be very fashionable at the moment. Um, this was an event which took place in New York uh, last year. Um, there's a Design Futures Lab in Melbourne, in, in Australia, who keep on sending me emails to get involved in that. Um, and then this appeared in The Economist magazine just this week. Um, 
The World in 2016, next year, and an article by my colleague from the Victoria and Albert Museum, Rory Hyde, on Future by Design. And um, the VMA, the museum where I'm based, uh, we're involved in a big exhibition about futures and future design and so on. And I don't know if you can see it, um, uh, towards the end of the um, uh, article, he says something about, you know, um, thinking about, you know, the future of design that was coming. But then he finishes it with a sentence, something like, um, uh, well, it's us who make our own futures. We can choose the futures that uh, uh, we make. Um, and it gets me thinking, well, you know, what, you know what, why, why this thing about the future of design? And I rather grumpily sent a tweet uh, three days ago before I came to Prague saying, what is this a future of design obsession that sweeping magazines, exhibitions, seminars, workshops and this lecture? Um, we barely understand what's going on now. And I sincerely believe that we have to really understand much better what design is, how it's functioning, for whom, in what ways, and where, and, uh, and so on, before we can uh, think about future of design. And in a way, for me, the future of design is a kind of, what we say in English, a tautology. It's something which says the same thing twice. Because when we think about design, design is always a future oriented activity. You're always thinking about what am I going to change to make the world or my space or whatever it is different in the future. Okay, So maybe that's one of the reasons why there's this interest in the future of design, because the design is always future, you know, forward-looking. Um, there's maybe a second one, which is more ideological for me, um, which is about the kind of financial, economic, neoliberal systems that we live in, this idea that we are always looking for future value in you know, the clothes we buy, the houses we buy, um, the shares we buy, of course, the commodities we buy, uh, and so on. There's a larger sort of economic system. And I think there's, this, there's something to be said about the rise of neoliberal financial systems and the rise of design alongside that, but that's another lecture. Okay. Um, so, uh, how do we think about futures? Um, there are, you know, lots of future forecasting companies very closely related to some design companies as well, or even says futures departments within some design uh, <coughs> companies uh, like uh, Seymour Powell and IDEO and, uh, and so on. And there are different techniques which are used uh, in future forecasting. And one of them is called extrapolators. And what you do is you take a trend which is happening and you look at the speed of change and then you think, well, that trend is going to continue at that sort of speed or maybe exponentially into the future. And one thing we can say, for example, is that you know, over the last 10 or 20 years, um, Design, the number of designers, the amount of design production, exportation and so on, has grown. And we can probably, for the time being, assume that that is going to continue. So I'll show you a whole series of graphs that do that, that do this. This is Argentina. This is Ontario in... No, it's not, Sweden. Um, this is Ontario, Canada. This is Milan, and this is the world, okay? Uh, United Nations have done a really big study of export of design, you know, all around the world. It's a fascinating statistics. It's just amazing. Every single country in the world, basically, is creating more what they call design and, and exporting it, and, and so on. Uh, and interestingly, so many developing countries are moving into this design space um, as well. Okay, so that's extrapolators. Um, but I think along with that, we can continue to forecast that design or designing will become increasingly more diverse. Um, this is my attempt, at least, to try and sort of map through four decades 
um, diff uh, the emergence of different kind of design specialisms, okay? Um, at least in the United Kingdom, America, Western Europe. And so you've got, you know, the traditional ones of furniture design, product design, and so on, in the 70s, and so on. I mean, some of them obviously go back longer. Then, you know, you've got retail design, exhibition design, leisure design, urban design, food design, and so on. The, what I'm trying to say here is that this isn't about one form of design replacing another. This is about a gradual, well, sometimes rapid, accumulation of new forms of design. You know, so in other words, design is becoming more diverse, more fragmented, and so on. Maybe we can continue, we will continue to see that, new specialisms emerging whilst traditional specialisms maintain themselves as well. You know, we still need chairs and logos and, you know, uh, what else? Transport and so on. So if you look at, for example, you know, design associations all around the world, you know, you find them multiplying and multiplying. And, and because the issue quite often is that, you know, a design association gets started and then a load of retail designers say, you're not representing our needs and we'll set up our own association and so on. So you get this constant fragmentation. And then I think a quite recent trend, perhaps of the last 10 years, is for design studios to sell themselves through their process. So in other words, they say to clients, you know, our, they don't say our style is this, you know, our house style and so on. They say our relationship will be like this. This is the way you as a client will um, experience working with us. This is our process, in other words. Um, you know, and so there's kind of more and more of these different pro design processes which are being sold. This is why I recommend that you don't read these books. Um, because I don't think it's very useful to talk, you know, to talk about design in general. Okay? Um, design is situated. You know, it's played out in different ways, in different scales, in different locations, in terms of different relationships and all kinds of things, in very different ways. And of course, you know, if design partly, um, you know, or, uh, no, not design, the economy, capitalist economy is driven by competitivity and differentiation, then you'll find... You know, designers themselves differentiating themselves. You know, this is again my process. This is you know different from their process, uh, and so on. So you know, books like Donald Norman's um, Emotional Design or a recent book called Design Attitude, which make a claim for the entire sort of design space and what design is, I think, are not very um, useful starting points. So there you go. Read mine instead. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, anyway, that was extrapolators. Another sort of way of um, looking at the future is this thing called pattern analysis, where you say there are recurring patterns in history. Um, and one I want to kind of talk about then is this idea of financial crisis. Um, of course, we've been in a very deep financial crisis since 19, sorry, 2007, 2008. Uh, and, you know, if you believe George Soros, the Hungarian-born uh, financier, you know, who says we'll be in it for at least 20 years, you know, this kind of global financial uh, crisis. Um, but that's not the only one. There's plenty of financial crises to choose from uh, which have taken place over the last, let's say, 15 years. Um, and, of course, missing from that list is the Greek financial crisis of this uh, last summer. So periods where banks have closed, you know, where factories are closed, you know, where basically so, you know, um, there's been you know, runs on the stock exchange and so on. And I'd like to argue that um, financial crises are good and bad for designers uh, in some contexts, or always qualifying, what I say. Um, this is, I don't know if you can see it. Um, yeah, it's an industry um, uh, survey which takes place every year. This is from 2011, I should say, of the United Kingdom. And it's just amazing because it shows how 
uh, you know, in some ways, design work has been driven down. So, for example, it says um, more than seven out of ten clients expect more work in, in pitches for free. Uh, eight out of ten expect more work for less money, uh, and so on. But I think, in a way, this is historical. I mean, I think designers have, you know, year and year, bit by bit, um, you know, their, their hourly price has been driven down. Um, so, and the pressure has been even greater, I think. And part of that's to do with the kind of development of clients' um, <coughs> knowledge of design, and, in a way, but also ignorance. So what happens out of that is that, <coughs> on the one hand, you get designers who... Um, you know, leave commercial design altogether and get involved in things like the Occupy movement and Occupy design and become super heavy activists. You get others who um, sell their design as a cost-saving exercise. And this is very interesting. This is um, published by a group called the Innovation Unit, based in London, and they work for public sector organisations. And... I don't know about here in Prague, but you know, in, in Britain we're facing roughly 40% cuts in public sector budgets. Um, you know, and like local authorities, and local councils, you know, they can cut back and cut back and cut back and get to the point where they can't cut back any further. So they have to think about how do we redesign our services? And really radically redesign our services and there's, there's been a huge growth of um, design consultancies who are looking at this sort of area. So what I'm saying is that the pattern here <coughs> is that whenever there's a recession I would argue um, a crisis that lots of designers begin to invent new ways of working new, um, and this is just uh, one of them I can give lots of other historical uh, examples. This is um, what a friend of mine said to me last weekend, he, his uh, friend James Mayer, who runs a, a furniture company called Viaduct in London. Um, and I was telling him I was coming to Prague, and he said, oh, what are you talking about? I said, I'm talking about financial crisis. They said, yeah, financial crisis, it's when creatives begin to do their job. Sounds a bit rude, but, um, you know, he, he, he very much sees that as well, even in his area of kind of cutting-edge, avant-garde um, furniture, that, you know, you get interesting movements forward. OK, so that's sort of one way into thinking about, well, two ways of thinking about futures, OK, extrapolators and pattern analysis. Um, so I want to move into sort of three areas. Uh, the photograph I'm using as the background for this talk um, was taken by a sort of activist, member of an activist collective in Denmark. Um, and this is a, um, it's a site for cultural production um, done by Bureau de Tour uh, there. Um, what it is is a kind of uh, deindustrialized area of... Um, the, uh, is Aarhus in Denmark, and they built this kind of uh, maker space and cultural centre thing with these containers and things. But I, for me, this photograph says a lot about kind of some of the key trends. I think um, you know you've got the containers, you know, with the globalisation, you know, containers moving around the world, urbanisation with, with the crane, um, and then you've got this bit. Uh, uh, activism and the kind of idea of grassroots activities. Well, this idea, though, of activist design and creative practice kind of working its way in to kind of dominant mainstream economic um, uh, practices. So I'm going to sort of look at this in a bit more detail. So let's look at globalisation. Oh, does anybody want to ask a question right now? <laughs> Chance to win a book. <laughs> All right, okay. 
I don't want to take these home, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As I'm carrying them onto the plane. Oh, God. Oh. Um, okay, so um, some statistics to blind you with. Um, right, there are nearly 5,000 container ships running around the world at the moment. Uh, there's only over 40 million of these containers, in the, roughly. Um, well, there were some 2,000. And 11. Uh, so there's a hell of a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things being moved around. If you want that more statistically, uh, this is a graph of the growth of exportation around the world uh, since 1990. And again, you know, it's one of these extrapolator uh, things. If you want to see this differently, um, this is a study which a couple of uh, journalists did. Um, a few years ago where they bought a pair of Lee Cooper jeans uh, and then they took them apart and worked out where all the different components of these jeans uh, came from. It comes from about 11 or 13 different uh, countries. You know, the zipper from um, the jeans factory in Tunisia, cotton from Benin and copper from Namibia, you know, and, and so on and so on and so on. So we got this idea that, uh, of... You know, this hugely sort of globalised, distributed, diffuse, fragmented kind of world of production we, um, we live in. But I want to kind of very briefly make a counterpoint, an argument against uh, that. And that actually, in a strange way, we're getting lots of relocalizations happening around the world. And partly as a result of the globalisation process. So, um, do you have a Zara in Prague? Yeah? yeah, okay. You know, fast fashion, they change the, the, the runs every two weeks. You know, they're um, you know, absolutely... Um, you know, they've got 200 designers and marketing people in their Zara centre in La Coruña in northwestern Spain and so on. Um, you know, and... You, you know, you go to Zara and there's very few of any one style on the shelves because, as I say, in two weeks' time, um, they'll be changed. Um, and they have a very, keep a very careful look on global trends of styles and, and uh, customer feedback um, and so on. Now, even though China is the biggest exporter of um, clothing in the world... Uh, particularly 2000, since 2005. Um, Zara, for example, doesn't source in China. It's too far away. It takes too long for the stuff to arrive into the shops in, West, in Europe and America and so wherever they are. Um, you know, they supply from Turkey, from North Africa a lot, uh, 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 and so on. And um, this kind of need for speed is affecting the kind of geography and the, the kind of concentrations of, um, for, of fast fashion design and uh, production. So I don't know if you are familiar with this brand of jeans called Mavi. I don't think they sell in... They don't sell in the United Kingdom either. They sell in Germany, Canada, America, and of course Turkey, a Turkish brand, and so on. And they're an example of a company who... Um, Yes, at one point they were subcontractors, you know, they just um, made the clothes and sent them through, mostly through German uh, retailers uh, and so on. And, the, and they began, like a lot of Turkish companies, to offer <coughs> uh, uh, more rounded, more f a full uh, set of uh, services because, you know, they've got the factories there, they've got the textiles there and so on, and they were able to, in themselves bring in sort of global trends information and then begin to produce their own designs uh, as well. Um, and the other thing is with in fast fashion is that, uh, you know, the brands, you know, uh, like, like Zara and so on, you know, they need this stuff fast. They can't sort of use a packaging person in Dusseldorf and uh, you know, uh, a textile manufacturer, manufacturer in Morocco and, uh, you know, a... Um, a clothing manufacturer in Turkey and pull these things together inside two weeks. They need things concentrated in, in particular um, places. Um, 
And this is why, uh, despite the multi-fibre agreement in 2005, that Turkey is now the second um, largest uh, manufacturer and exporter of clothing in the world. Because the multi-fibre agreement uh, took away all um, uh, exportation, or, um, all, um, what do you call it, uh, defence of importation, you know, it allowed for a kind of free movement of textiles and garments and so on around the world in 2005, and then uh, people thought, oh no, China are going to overrun the world, you know, with their uh, clothing, uh, because they've got such a massive um, manufacturing base. Um, and the Turkish, uh, Turkish manufacturers began to sort of, if you like, move up the chain and concentrate their design, uh, materials, manufacture, development, and so on, uh, much more. And with a lot of government support as well. Okay, talking about jeans then, um, this isn't uh, Turkey, but this is actually in Los Angeles. And again, it says something about sort of movement and different kind of trends uh, around the world. And there's a huge um, fast fashion uh, industry in Los Angeles now, which is quite recent, due to lots of Koreans moving into Los Angeles from countries like Brazil, um, Argentina, uh, Venezuela, and so on. This happened in, around about the 1990s, originally, um, that uh, because of the instability of the economies in Latin America, uh, these Koreans moved to Los Angeles because Los Angeles also had a big garment industry partly to do with the Hollywood uh, and so on, you know, and kind of form, you know, have a sort of social relationships, particularly through the churches and so on, uh, worked in sort of import exportation, but then began to, you know, concentrate their sort of design activities and so on. And being kind of very diasporic, being very international, cosmopolitan, these Koreans, then, you know, they, had, they also knew of manufacturers in Vietnam and Korea and China and so on. So we had the very international networks as well. And then their children started going to, you know, university like CalArts and, uh, and so on, um, learning about sort of fashion branding and, uh, you know, uh, fashion management and so on. And so then cre created this kind of concentration, this uh, cluster of design and manufacturing around... Um, uh, uh, fashion. Hence, Forever 21, the American um, fashion brand is mostly a Korean company. Hence, Urban Outfitters as well, which is uh, you know, mostly driven in, in the background by these Koreans. Really interesting. Okay. So we're talking about clustering and bringing things together. And you know, obviously, another big world theme is urbanization. And you know, we know of these statistics about, you know, 2000 and where was it, five, I think, you know, they reckoned that more than half the world's population lived in ur urban areas, you know, and by 2050, it will be 70% of the world's uh, population in living in their urban areas. And sometimes I think this is presented to us as something which is very same, homogenous, you know, that all these mega cities around the world look like this. I haven't a clue which city this is, possibly a Latin American city, but, you know, it could be one of those, uh, you know, uh, the five, five of the top 25 mega cities at the moment are Chinese, it could be a Chinese city, and talking about China, let's move on to talk about China or not. Um, I say it's not all China. Well, it is and it isn't. Um, but some more statistics for us to think about. Um, you know, China is now the world's biggest ex exporter, exports 11% um, of, uh, you know, global value exportation and so on. But it's kind of really heavily, quickly moving into, um, you know, a knowledge economy, you know, it's uh, higher institutions, uh, higher education institutions, universities, in other words, have doubled in number in 10 years. Um, frighteningly, 300,000 design graduates a year. Um, 
but also behind this, you know, lots of government government support for creative industries, creative clusters, um, and so on. But that might seem very kind of clean, as it were. Um, and I think on the ground, the um, situation is interestingly chaotic. So if you take um, Shenzhen, uh, which is kind of right next to Hong Kong, really, population 14 million. It was a small fishing village just a few decades ago. Um, and a colleague of mine, Kat Rossi, has just come back from uh, Shenzhen and sent me these pictures, just amazing, uh, you know, of you know, street industry, you know, um, kind of quite high-value sewing going on uh, in the Dong, um, it's called the Dongden area, you know, um, and then Shenzhen is kind of famous for its what's called Shanzai <laughs> production of uh, copying Western brands, you know, like Nike and KLG and the Triple Arch of, uh, of uh, McDonald's and so on. Um, and the, the Chinese word Shanzai uh, means kind of bandit, bandit practices, bandit activities. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, this, it's a almost a romantic idea about it. And sometimes this is done quite um, knowingly and ironically uh, as well. Um, and sometimes with a view to improving things. So, for example, you can buy an iPhone with two SIM slots in Shenzhen. You know, much better. <laughs> I, I've got a fair phone, mine's got two SIM slots. Don't, don't go with this uh, Apple nonsense. Buy yourself a fair phone, ethical phone. Do you know about these? Fair phones from no. the Netherlands? No. Really worth looking at. They're, they're an ethical f uh, phone company, okay? So uh, they, they're completely transparent about their, um, their supply chains. They try and uh, source all the minerals and things from non-exploitative areas. You know, they're the absolute opposite of Apple in terms of their transparency. You know, everything's on the website, where they get the stuff from, how much it costs, what the company, you know, so investment plan is, uh, and everything. It's really fascinating. So that was um, a digression. Um, so anyway, so for example, um, you know, there's a huge amount of, sort of copying but making better um, so that you know, 30% of the Indian uh, smartphone market is supplied through Shenzhen. Okay, that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, mobile phones. There's stuff like this, you know, components, you know, washing all over the city, you know, and being put together in interesting ways. So what's happening here is that there's this kind of meeting between um, kind of craft artisanal making, I suppose, and very high technology, very clever uh, kinds of um, uh, practices. And it's, there's not a sort of strategy about this. It's almost like, you know, all this energy and uh, activity is happening and being experimented with, and absolutely crucially, is be, they're being entirely open. This is open innovation. <coughs> there's no use of... Um, intellectual property or patenting and design and uh, you know, design registration or anything like that. Indeed, there are several websites like this. This is um, it's called 52rd.com. Um, and it's just a website for sharing technical information. Um, there's something like 120,000 people are signed up to this as being active in sharing technical information uh, there. Okay, so that is a kind of dizzy, you know, example, I suppose. Not necessarily about financial crisis, but where there's this kind of very interesting sort of um, uh, concentrations of activity uh, going on. Um, and okay, so there's all this talk about urbanisation and growing cities uh, and so on. But we have to remember that, you know, one... Perhaps one place is urbanisation, is another place is de-urbanisation, okay? 
Um, and this, not easy to see, but this map on the left here shows all the cities around the world which are shrinking, which are decreasing in size. Okay. Um, you know, cities like Manchester, Detroit, Cleveland, Leipzig, Dresden, Dessau, and so on, are all losing uh, population. So there's a sense of having to sometimes rethink design in cities. Re think about managed decline, perhaps, or think about, you know, what does that leave behind, and what can we use that's left behind? You know, hence places like Cleveland and Detroit are really interesting because there's a whole you know, movement of, of urban agriculture, for example, turning over original spaces which were urban to um, uh, production of, um, of food, which is really nice. Okay, so that brings us me to this kind of third theme of sort of activism. And I'm, I'm thinking about activism in a very kind of broad way. Okay, I used to think about it, uh, you know... Um, you know, kind of a slightly Maoist way or something like that, like, you know, activism where it was about sort of overturning the state and, you know, the, the uh, system and, and so on, which I still would like to happen. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I think you can be sort of activist in, in all kinds of ways, you know, of, uh, you know, of, you know, working through, within, but outside kind of dominant uh, uh, systems. And I just want to show you a couple of examples where this is some interesting activities um, are taking place. One is in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. Um, and we already noted that there was a dire financial crisis in Argentina between 1999 and 2001. Um, in 2001, the banks closed for three months. You know, factories closed and so on. What happened then in many places... I mean, Buenos Aires is actually quite an industrial city, and uh, there are a lot of worker takeovers of these cities. Uh, ignore the tourist in the front there. Uh, such as this one here. Now, this um, factory uh, was an aluminium goods production factory, so they did everything from tins to aeroplanes uh, made in this factory. And, um, there was, it closed down in 2001, and then there was a sort of worker uh, takeover, and they began to then use the factory space to build other things. They, they've got a, a sort of cultural centre, a school, um, they've got small production units, and so it's absolutely massive space, you can't really see it. Uh, probably better here. So a little corner, for example, where there's a group of people sort of making stuff uh, using a little... The, the old machinery uh, there. And uh, then eventually, I found this group of women I'd gone to uh, find. They're called the Cooperativa de Diseño, the Co Design Cooperative. Um, a group of seven women who work within this complex um, and they dedicate themselves entirely to, to communitarian um, uh, work, to... Uh, uh, trade unions, uh, work to uh, uh, political struggles, and so on, and work in sort of graphics, video production, uh, in uh, web design, product design, and so on. So, for example, um, these are some what are called bastons, um, uh, walking, sticks. walking sticks. Thank you. My English isn't so good tonight. Um, <laughs> um, uh, which are manufactured in that space. So they're producing some new products for this old factory in a way to sort of, you know, uh, um, re-energise, I suppose, some of its uh, production there. So they kind of work in what might be called in political theory terms, maybe horizontalism. So they're not looking to make profit from other, you know, people, you know, for financiers or venture capital or whatever. They're trying to sort of work sideways into um, other sort of groups and organisations alongside them. I met them bec um, mostly because I was in Buenos Aires to give a lecture and in the lecture I was talking about how design studios organise their workflow using pro software packages or Excel sheets and so on. And they said, oh, we've got one of those. 
and they showed me it, and it's really interesting because, um, you know, the traditional way in sort of profit-driven design companies is, you know, you get a client, you establish a fee, you then um, part, apportion the work out to people working there, the number of hours, and then you, you, you know, work out the costs against those hours uh, and, and so on. They do it the other way around. They look at what do the seven of us need, you know, to live. You know, our rent. You know, we've got uh, people dependent on us, children, and, and so on. Um, one of them really likes buying shoes, um, uh, <laughs> and so on. And then they sort of apportion the the kind of profits from their uh, their work uh, accordingly, according to their needs, as opposed to their their input. But then work in a very kind of cooperative kind of uh, way uh, as well. Um, so it's kind of an interesting way of rethinking time uh, and how you might work in a uh, studio. Um, and I've been doing a project recently with a, uh, another system for uh, managing time, um, which is a thing called the Leeds Creative Time Bank. Leeds is a, is a sort of post-industrial city in the north of England. I lived there for about 20 uh, years. And they've created this time bank for creative people. Okay? Now, a time bank, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept, it's just like a bank, except for it's not money, it's time you put into the bank. So you, uh, you do some work for someone that gives you, say, let's say two hours, that's in the bank. You can then get someone else within this system to work for two hours and so on. Um, this video, hopefully, will explain it better than me. Okay, so um, that's a little 
snapshot, little photo of the Leeds Creative Time Bank. Um, I was kind of involved when it was started, which interestingly was 2006, really before the big financial crisis, we could see it coming. You know, the triple crunch that Subal in the video talked about, the triple crunch of climate change, um, of peak oil, um, weirdly, peak, peak oil, oh, never mind, um, price of oil has dropped since then, um, and, um, yeah, and, and financial crisis, we could see, you know, the sort of, the, the property market was collapsing, and all kinds of things, and we could see that the funding, the budgets for doing creative work, uh, were going to be disappearing very soon, so we had to, we were thinking about, well, how can we support you know, creative practices, uh, you know, as she says, from a, with a non-cash economy, okay? Because maybe in a place like Leeds, people have got more time than, you know, to spare than money to spare. Um, and what's been interesting, because I've been back working with the project with the Time Bank recently, <coughs> is that it's created a much di a different approach to risk, because. Um, you know, you maybe sort of create a collaboration between a dancer, a video maker, a graphic designer, and, and an architect, okay, to, as an experiment, okay, and you maybe only lose, you know, three hours rather than, you know, 100 euros or something like that, and, you know, that's the kind of, uh, allows for much more prototyping, much more experimentation within this. And the second thing is, as she mentioned, um, it's created a social economy as well. It's brought sort of people, created people in the city closer to um, together. Okay, so I think this is my last example I want to, want to talk about in terms of responses to financial crisis. Um, and this is in, um, yeah, where that red dot is, in a really horrible place called um, Colding. Uh, I, I kind of can speak from some authority because I was a visiting professor at the university there for two years and every two months I had to go to this god-awful place and, <laughs> and, and you go there and it is, you know, the main street is just nothing um, and it's a city which is built on logistics, okay, so it's a big hub for um, moving goods around Europe and, and so on. Um, but, you know, because of the financial crisis, not much was moving and so on, and the economy of the city, it's only 60,000 inhabitants, was pretty much on its knees. Um, it had an ageing uh, population, young people didn't stay there, um, and you walk down the streets and they're, they're very empty. There's lots of delay, which means uh, to, to let signs in shops, uh, empty spaces, and so on. And about... Three, yeah, three years ago, no, four years ago, um, the municipality of Colding realised that they had to reinvent the city. Um, so they created a sort of um, big consultation, three consultation events with citizens um, to talk about, well, if we're going to be a different city, what kind of city are we going to be? Um, and they kind of boiled it down and boiled it down and boiled it down over these things. In Denmark, I, I've, I find that meetings take an awful long time in a very interesting way. They're very boring, but also, um, but also the outcome is very positive because what you're trying to do is reach a kind of consensus, an agreement between everyone. And once you've done that, it's much easier to do things afterwards because everyone kind of is on board, everyone is part of the project, okay? So, what they came out with was this thing called Colding We Design for Life. Okay, so um, rather than be a logistics city or a cultural city or whatever, they decided they were going to be a design city. Okay, now, that, okay, there were some resources for that. There was a very good design school and a university with a lot of design people uh, in it as well, and a few small companies, you know, which were design-led. But this was a bigger vision, really, uh, uh, which looks a bit like, uh, probably best like this, actually. Um, 
Now, if you go there, you know, there aren't any sort of fantastic, you know, modern museums or boutique shops or, uh, you know, creative quarters where lots of trendy hipsters, you know, are working. Um, uh, in, instead, it's the idea that they're going to put branding, sorry, branding, design at the centre of all their activities. Okay, so at the centre of its education system, so that, for example, there's a uh, primary school, you know, for little children, uh, where all the classes are taught through design. Okay, so they teach history. So you know, what would you know uh, a Viking? How would a Viking design a sword or something like that? You know, um, you know uh, it would be at the centre of its entrepreneur. And also at the centre of its uh, social welfare uh, systems uh, as well. So a whole sort of um, uh, cre- you know, development of design thinking within its, all its services. And so um, you know, uh, civil servants of council workers you know, were trained in designing and design thinking and so on. And partly my role there, I ran a few workshops which was which were really about thinking about, well, um, what do we mean by this? You know, how do we understand it? If we can't see it, if it's in the way we think, or the way we're educated, or whatever it is, or you know, the way we manage, um, you know, how do we know it's there? Uh, you know, how do we make this visible? How do we think about it? Uh, and so on. So this is kind of like a, a form of scenario planning, thinking about, well, you know, what do we want this thing to... Um, look like. Which brings me to my last point, which is about scenario planning. So this is the third way by which future forecasters think about the future. Um, There's several other ways as well, but I'm just going to cover three tonight. Done extrapolators, done uh, pattern analysis. Scenario planning, which is really good fun, um, because it's saying we don't know what the future will be, but we can prepare for different kinds of possibilities, okay? Um, and we're not very good at this, I don't think. You think about, you know, that the CIA didn't, you know, American CIA didn't um, uh, anticipate the Velvet Revolution, you know? Um, they didn't anticipate 9-11. They didn't, uh, you know, antici- uh, was it, anticipate the... Financial crash of 2007 uh, 8. Mad. How, how do they do it? All the resources. But anyway, so um, scenario planning. Okay, so you know, you think about you can do it easily like this. You put, for example, economic growth on one axis, social cohesion on another, and you think what happens if, for example, you've got low economic growth, um, low s- social co- cohesion? What happens if you've got high economic growth and low social co- cohesion, and so on? You know, and then you can put in where everything is nice, uh, high economic growth, <laughs> high social cohesion, and everything is okay except for you end up with a lot of spoiled children. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so you know, this is perhaps one way we can think about it. We can think about you know several possibilities, but I think the really important thing is for us to look at the very specific circumstances. Um, we're living in, be they global or uh, local. Look at, you know, what are the uh, resources that we have, both human and material, technological, uh, and and so on, in a locality, and how do they relate to a bigger global picture or regional picture, um, and so on. Um, But we also also can ask ourselves, you know, what scenarios do we want? You know, how do we want to work and live? Which is probably the same as asking... What futures do we want? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now it's your turn. So I will start with the first question. You can't. I'm a very shy audience, I have to say. No, no, no. We have to hold them. Uh, I'm uh, curious about your um, last example you showed. So how the story finished? How the uh, how the city in Denmark what they changed and what yeah, design yeah, I see. Well, that's really interesting because 
Um, Danish, I don't know about politics in the Czech Republic. At Republic, I don't get the impression that they are like Danish politics. Danish politics very much works on, you know, sort of long-term term consensus. There's a sort of centre-left sets of coalitions, okay, uh, and that allows for much more continuity of policy. So, uh, in Kolding, um, this is a 10-year project, so they're three years in now, seven years to go, and in the meantime, they know there are going to be two elections, but they also know that, or you know, at least hope, unless something mad happens, that the general kind of political um, agreement <coughs> about this policy will still stay in place. It may, may change in its uh, details and so on, but you know, there's kind of investment for a kind of very slow moving, quite long term. Uh, project. I think it should be 20 years, you know, a generation, in fact. Um, but that is partly... Uh, I mean, obviously there are always um, sabotage of right. these things, you know, it's sort of, oh, you know, it's not like we can't sit here and do yes, this sort of thing, you know. Um, and, um, but they seem to sort of weather on. I, I think partly because there's not an, there isn't a, an alternative at the moment. But, but I think part of the sabotage sometimes is also about, you know, central budgets, you know, from central government being cut and changes in central government uh, and so on. Um, so, you know, it is not entirely stable, but, how, you know, how I live in hope. What I would really like to have happened whilst I was there, I was there 2012 <coughs> to 14, I think. Yeah, I think so, that was it. And I really wanted the university to be much more involved in the city, and I wanted student projects, you know, all the student projects to be involved in the city, uh, and so on. But that's kind of, it was difficult, it was, sort of, it was only me. Yeah. <laughs> do you do get to read a book? <laughs> I would like to read that one. <laughs> well, maybe for... Uh, I think we should give you yeah, the other yeah, part sure. of the, uh, okay. the tea. So, yeah. another question? Yeah, so <laughs> Uh, yeah. So you've got, uh, Colding has 60,000 people, it's a logistics center, it's a dying logistics center, yeah. um, and they're building a culture of design, it yeah. sounds like, and so they're three years into it. Uh, obviously, patience is necessary yeah. in order to get there, So, but yet, it, it, patience has to be backed by showing some dividends, you know, like we're, we're starting to get some benefits, we're, are, are they starting to, three years into this? See, for example, people coming to Colding, you know, in search of design solutions, and 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 they're taking logistics workers and, and mm, repurposing mm, them. And yeah, is that all? How's that all? That's a very good there? question to ask, and I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but there again, you've won a book, so that's <laughs> really good. <laughs> and I get from you, you'd rather read that than these checks. Yes, because yes. yeah, I'm going to say yeah. okay. okay. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll do it like that way. Then. Yeah, no, it's just a really interesting question. I don't know. Um, there's uh, certainly, you know, it's, you know, it's a gradual process. They've, they've just started, you know, and you think, oh, God, no, not another one. They've just started a design week, like a design festival. Mm -hmm. think, oh, God, we've got so many of these around Europe now. But on the other hand, you know, what they're trying to do is celebrate the local stuff. Right. Bring in a few international stars, you know, just to get people from outside in, you know, and so on. But, um, you know, they're kind of taking it as a sort of step-by-step -step process because it, you know, really does take a, you know, a big change of mindset of civil service, you know, not civil service, council yeah. you know, employees, you know, to start off with, you know. And we'll Keeping see. the naysayers. Yeah, yeah, the exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We have another question. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to go back a bit. But um, the fast fashion thing caught my attention, and I'm really curious. It might be a bit stupid question, but. No, it's but, fantastic. Um, you still wouldn't have a book. Actually, uh, do you think where, where, where this uh, fashion thing, gonna, like fast fashion thing, going to lead to? What yeah, is yeah. going to happen? Like, is it going to take two days, not two weeks? Or <laughs> yes. is it going to crush down? Because it's going to be discussed uh, lately. And, uh, for, for some time, I know there, there's a new movie um, going to, to, to theatre about this fashion thing movie and, and stuff like that. So, so what's your? Yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, 
Yeah, but Zara aren't the fastest. There's a fa- I can't remember the name. There's a company now doing stuff inside one week. Oh. You know, from uh-uh. you know from conception to design to manufacture to it being on the shelves in the shops. You know. I mean, I've heard this myth. I, I think it's not true, but that they they're used, they're manufacturing on ships. No. Oh. Yeah. I, I don't think that. I think that's just a myth about that. <laughs> so, you know, you meant, you just talked about Shenzhen. I, I worked at Shenzhen for a year. And okay. There's a company in China, uh, Xiaomi. And Xiaomi, with their cell phones, you know, Apple, they make a big deal. They just came off with, I don't know, 8 1 or something. This is a year later, there's another. And Xiaomi has weekly releases of their. Yeah, yeah. And anybody who's a Xiaomi customer, each week they've got a new operating system with new icons, new. Uh, applets, new whatever, yeah, every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So fast, fast phones. Yeah. Fast yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know, fast fashion, what, the, the question is kind of where will it end up? Yeah, yeah. Like what's the future? I mean, We've wearing it happen? before we've even had thought about it. Everything yeah. yeah. is getting faster and faster, so, so yeah, yeah. what's going to happen? Well, yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> you know, the thing I haven't talked about is things like the slow city movement, you know, which is an alternative. I, I wear slow fashion. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but seriously, this stuff's made in a shop in a small village in, in Britain, you know, I, it takes five weeks to be made and, you know, and so on, I do it to order, and it's all sort of retro 1950s, 40s stuff and, and so on. You know, whether that takes off in a big way, I don't know. There's the, there's the slow city movement, which has, I think, about 250 members around the what is city. They have to be, I think... Places under 17,000, I think it is, very small places, which turn, you know, signing up to this idea of relocalization of uh, making and craft and everything. And then there's, are you familiar with the transition towns movement? Any of you heard of that? That's a, that's a global network of towns and suburbs and villages who are, um, are setting out to be carbon neutral and to completely relocalize all their sort of food networks or their manufacturing networks. Their, uh, you know, there's a whole thing about the great reskilling. Okay, uh, There's two or three in, in, in the Czech Republic. I can't remember the names of them. But if you Google transition towns, you'll, you'll find them. You know, and that's a sort of kind of crafty you know, sort of return to you know, sort of localization. Uh, and so on, but there's over 700 people in there. Uh, sorry, 700 places in their global um, network, and they have a whole program of how you create this. And whether that then means you know, you know, there'll be a sort of movement against fast fashion. I doubt it. You know, very tiny, tiny, tiny thing. And it's symbolically interesting, but you know. um, but you know, in terms of where fashion, fast fashion is going, the world's a big place. And if you think about and one of the things, you know, about Shenzhen, you, you know probably a lot more than me about this, is, you know, you know we've got this, I, for me at least, in the UK, we've got this idea of, you know, Western Europe, uh, or particularly UK, knowledge, economy, creativity, design, which is all then made in China, and then, you know, comes... Uh, but, you know, China, what they're doing is, big part of their exports are to, you know, global south to global south, you know, to, you know... Um, East Asia and so on to Africa and, uh, and so on, you know. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the whole networks of trade are sort of changing at the same time. So, uh, it's really difficult to say on a kind of global scale, it's such a big question. But you win a book. <laughs> <laughs> Which one do you want? Actually, if you sit, you're interested in fashion. Uh, no, not at all. I'm just curious to ask. It's about um, a. Uh, uh, textile manufacturer in 19th century England. It's uh, uh, <laughs> Birkin's a funerary parlour. Uh, um, there is still one book left. Still one book left? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think you're from the team, so. Um, where, where was that question? I have kind of, I guess, maybe a broad question. Yeah. But do you have any comments on the relation of the financial crisis, human rights violations, and fast fashion companies, and the globalised design market? Yeah. Do I have a. Like any comments? on how those three things relate. The relation is shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, oh, 
God, I can't remember. In the Victorian Albert <laughs> We're kind of addressing this in the Victorian Albert Museum, actually, because um, we've started a project about two years ago called Rapid Response uh, Curating. And what we do is we exhibit a new object every month or two months, which are kind of um, uh, sort of objects which are about contemporary global, social, cultural, economic issues. So, for example, you know, when that factory collapsed about three years ago, the Rana Plaza, I think it was, in Bangladesh, uh, we've been exhibiting a pair of um, Primark chinos which were made there. You know. uh, and then we've had, to, oh, what's her name? Famous person. These eyelashes which are made uh, just, someone discovered that these eyel you know, false eyelashes were being made by someone in Indonesia for uh, something like 20s, what would that be, 20, 30, well, the euro, 0.3 of a euro an hour, you know, this sort of thing. So we've been exhibiting those sorts of things, and, you know, to raise a sort of debate and discussion about these whole global uh, networks and so on. So, so the thing about financial uh, uh, finance for crisis, yes, it is um, why it's so bad. Well, one of the many things which has uh, uh, been so bad. Yes, there are kind of movements amongst the big brands to be transparent and to show that they, you know, they use non-exploited labour uh, and so on. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's um, resulted in also in even more deregulation, I think, of uh, of marketplaces and so on, which is you know, press pretty so much more pressure on the manufacturing and making in certain places of the world and so on. So, you know, I think there'll be a lot more factories collapsing and horrible sweatshop conditions, you know. Um, and I don't think stopping, you know, I think part of the problem with this, personally, has been that the sort of activist end of it, the pushback, has been so much at a consumption end of things. You know, oh, stop buying this, you know. Um, you know, don't buy that, don't buy this, and, and so on, which is kind of, you know, uh, after the, the horse has bolted, you know, after the, you know, it's too late, really, because the stuff's been made. We need to be thinking much more in terms of, you know, regulation and things like that. But, you, know. Um, you know, that's difficult. As Bill Mollison, who was a 1970s um, uh, developer of an uh, agriculture system called permaculture, which is a really interesting, low-impact uh, system for growing vegetables and you know, food and stuff, said, uh, I can't change the world on my own. It's going to take at least three of us. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you get a book, don't you? <laughs> Oh, oh, I see. Right. Okay. Good. Sorry, was that? You've had a hand up a few times. I know, Philip. But, uh, should we go for a non uh, non check design question first? Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering uh, how the Leeds uh, Yeah, okay. So it's creative, not just design. So it's, you know, photographers, writers, actors, uh, filmmakers, any, anyone within a kind of creative sphere, right. si sign up to it, okay. Um, and instead of, be, of it being like, um, what, are you a designer? Yeah. Okay, what do you design? Uh, shoes. Okay. So, if I mean, I generally write, so it's not a direct thing. If I write, spend two hours writing your material for you, then I get two hours back from you designing my shoes. Um, for example, I might not want my shoes designed. Um, I might want some other, something else in this network, like someone to take some photographs for you. So, I do two hours for you. That puts two hours into the bank. I've got two hours in this yeah. bank, which I can then spend on someone else like a photographer or something else, you see. Um, so it's not about direct, necessarily about direct exchange. It's about putting in and then you can take back out. And what's really interesting, one of the things that's really interesting about it is that it's completely, um, what's the word, uh, you know, 
an hour is an hour is an hour. Okay. okay. So if you've got you know um, an architect who's you know hourly rate uses I don't know forty euros an hour, and then you've got a photographer whose rate is hundred euros an hour, and then you know um, an actor whose rate is ten euros an hour, whatever. That doesn't matter. Everything is equal. It's completely mm -hmm. a socialistic system. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's, it's supported by a, a, a website, and so on, which, which, which is, creates the platform for the exchange. Mm -hmm. So it's been around since, two, I wanted to ask a question about that too. It's been around since 2006. <coughs> How is it working? Really well. It, 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 funnily enough, it, it, it started and it had some funding from the Arts Council of England um, as a project. It then collapsed entirely yeah. and then started again. Huh. And now it's got 70 um, active members. It's got over about over 200 people signed up to about 70 people active within it. You know, for a city yeah. of about 700,000. Okay. Yeah. So it's a reasonable, reasonable amount of its creative industries involved. Yeah. yeah. So time for the last question. Go on, Philip. <laughs> oh, no, come here too. Go on. <laughs> Quick question. Just, uh, I was just wondering if we have any alternative works for uh, uh, creative industry. This conversation. If there is anything, because I still, I still think it's just uh, uh, you have to be creative around the industry, and you have to, you know, uh, you have to uh, think twice. If, it, if, it, uh, if there is any alternative way to say this. Yeah, I know. No, I know what you mean it's a difficult term. Uh, John Thackeray, who I have a lot of respect for, uh, you know, hates the term creative industry because it suggests that there are these people who are creative and there are these people who aren't creative. You know, it's a res restrictive term. You know, I'm, I'm kind of using it in the kind of usual government policy term um, unenthusiastically. <laughs> yeah. So you had a question? Uh, I have a question to get back to the first question. Yeah. It's very interesting mm. thinking. And I was uh, thinking about the thing that really involved with fast design as well. You know, the profession is not so unique anymore. I mean, like, I have this feeling. And uh, just everybody could, could and want to do the creative profession. So, you know, and... Uh, the clients will just to do a few clicks on the internet. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So the question is really about, it's about professionalization, really, you know, because, yeah, um, uh, I mean, you could say that for many areas like coding yeah. and graphics and so on, you know, uh, that the professional status of designers is always kind of under threat. You know, and that's partly why you know that thing about new specialisms in design being created. It's quite often, uh, you know, where sometimes it's to do, I think, with recession and financial crisis, and they say, "Oh, I could do something else instead." Um, sometimes it's when a profession has lots of entry people from who are not trained and so on, so they have to say we have to do something else and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I was talking with someone the other day who used to work in a fashion forecasting company mm -hmm. and they're a really big um, a company in terms of their influence because what they do is you know they, they do all their kind of trends and forecasting and so on you know and then they put onto their website you know these are the colors which will be used but they actually now you know provide software so that you know the brands can then just basically assemble you know, the designs from what they've got on their, uh, their website. So it's almost like they say, we're forecasting, they're not forecasting, they're actually creating, you know, the future, you know, through this kind of kit, this system, really. Um, so, you know, that is, um, that is happening, you know, but we have, to, we have to know about that and think about how to respond. Yeah. It is sad, it is sad. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's also, it's also limited. I mean, I've been doing a bit of work around this thing called um, platform capitalism. Uh, do you like Uber? 
you know, yeah. uh, things like Airbnb and things like that. But there are also, as you probably know, lots of um, graphic design, um, so platform capitalist systems, capitalism systems, where you can, you know, you as a client can say, put up a job, a bit like Mechanical Turk, I don't know if you're familiar with that. You can say, um, I want this logo design for my company, and then uh, people can, all over the world can then put in proposals and budgets and this sort of thing, and then you choose the cheapest or the best or, uh, um, or whatever, you know. And, um, you know, but that's, you can only really do that with kind of very focused stuff like logo design. You can't do a whole sort of branding campaign for that, or, you know, you can't do a service design process or stuff which involves a lot of, you know, client contact and a lot of user analysis or, you know, more complex things, you know. So, so maybe, you know, those, those examples are kind of restricted and there's going to be still lots of other areas, you know. I mean, it's a bit like the books, really. And this, is, this, this design for the cover is horrible. Um, but, um, <laughs> but what's happening, you know, with publishing, you know, is that there's been a real return. I mean, since Kindle... And digital books, there's been a real return to looking at quality, you know, uh, type and printing and binding uh, and so on, you know, because to get into back into that, you know, love of the physical objects, I mean, there's always a response. You're not, you're not convinced? <laughs> yeah. No. So, thank you very much. That was oh, a pleasure for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.